Uh, just while everyone's joining, feel free to head to menti.com and enter the code at the top of the screen here, which is 36283091. So for anyone who's just joining, please head on over to menti.com and use that code. Um, it's just so that when we ask some questions during the webinar, you'll be able to interact and give some responses. Um, so just to read that code again, so that's 36283091. Okay, um, so welcome to everyone that's just joining and um, hopefully you'll recognize me. My name's Ellie from last week for anyone who was here. Um, I'm a final year student at Hull York Medical School and today we've got another host. So last week we had Shivam, but today we've got Ashir. So Ashir, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name's Ashir. I'm a second year medical student at Hull York Medical School, just like Ellie. Um, I, someone's got their um, audio on it. Is hello, hello, man, share. So, just as a general reminder to everyone, just make sure that you keep your cameras and microphones off. Um, compared to our usual sessions, um, we will be having the chat off predominantly in this session uh, just because I know last week there were some issues um, but for those of you who have Instagram if you head on over to Instagram on our Medic Mind story you'll see that you're able to submit questions uh, so if, if you do have questions throughout today you can head on over to Instagram and you can message us that way instead of using the chat today so we're just doing things slightly differently to usual. Okay, perfect. Um, so for everyone that's just joining, just for anyone who didn't hear at the start, if you head to menti.com and fill in the code at the top of the screen, you'll be able to interact. And today is all about the BMAT. Uh, so last week we focused on the UCAT, one of the admissions tests that we said was needed by pretty much every medical school. Whereas the BMAT today is needed by more of a select number of medical schools. So a slightly different focus today. So Ashir, do you think we're ready to get started? Absolutely. Um, would you like me to start with the timeline? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. So um, for medical applications, there's either the UCAT or BMAT that you can do, or both. In fact, most people go for the UCAT because most of the universities will be um, requiring the UCAT. There's only a handful of BMAT universities, which we'll go over in a moment. And typically you have the sitting in September or November. Last year, there was no September sitting due to COVID. They decided to do the test for everyone um, on a device at school or a test center. And that was in November. Usually um, you get a little time frame to do uh, the UCAT, which you would sit at Pearson Center, um, the same kind of center you would be sitting your um, theory test at for driving. Um, it's at between July till September. Um, you have until uh, I think the third um, week of September to enroll to do the test, but you should ideally book it way before and try to, if you want to rearrange it, rearrange it for later on in September. The UCAT result you'll get straight away, whereas the BMAT you typically get after two or three weeks after sitting the test. So it's slightly more of a riskier test. Um, the personal statement is something you'll be working throughout the summer one. Mm -hmm. um, I'm supposing you guys do not have too much um, work experience opportunities, but there's quite a few online that you can find just to kind of strengthen your personal statement. That's something you'll work closer to the October 15th deadline on. And typically between November till April, you will get um, university interviews depending on which university you've applied to. Some do it before Christmas. Some will typically do it very last minute, like March and April. And then um, if you've applied to four medical schools, you'll probably have them spaced out throughout that time. So it's quite a long application procedure and you're probably going to be working on your A-levels throughout the time as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Ashir. Um, so hopefully this timeline does look quite familiar to those of you who were here last week. We did start going over this. Um, but the key thing is, as Ashir was saying, you have opportunities to sit the BMAT in both September and November. Um, as was just mentioned, this year that was slightly different because of COVID, so they only had one sitting. Obviously, we don't know for certain what's going to happen next year. Hopefully, it will be back to two sittings. And certainly, when we do this presentation, we'll talk about the pros and cons of September and November sittings. Um, but keep an eye on the official guidance is what I would say, just in light of COVID. Um, so, Ashir, I'm just looking at the Instagram. And one of the questions we've been asked already is, how do you juggle your BMAP preparation with your UCAP preparation? Because as you've said, you're going to need the UCAT for a lot of universities, whereas the BMAT's more selective. So some people will probably be taking both. And um, so how would you start to juggle that preparation? 
Actually, they're both. Um, it's a good, really good question. Actually, a lot of people will be sitting both the UCAT and BMAT, especially if they have one of the BMAT universities on their mm -hmm. list, or they don't do too well on the UCAT and they use the BMAT as a backup. Um, typically, since they are um, aptitude tests, you will need to start quite early on and try and spread your preparation out over quite a few period of weeks. Okay. Um, for the UCAT, again, the strategies that are being tested are not something that you need to know prior knowledge for, maybe just a bit of math for the quantitative reasoning, but it's yeah. good to work on them consistently over a long period of time. Even an hour on the weekend at this time for the UCAT is good. Um, now the BMAT is in September or November. They haven't said if the September sitting is going to go through this year, but mm -hmm. um, typically we tell students to do the UCAT earlier on so they can spend some time focusing on the personal statement and the BMAT as you will have your A-level starting in September as well, um, your year 13 um, A2, so which are a lot more stressful. And um, applying to medicine with all of the application procedures is going to take a lot of your time up anyway. So it's good to stay consistent with it. Mm -hmm. For the BMAT, you have a lot of biology, chemistry, physics, and maths, which is all GCSE level. So it's good to stay up to date with those and constantly um, study them throughout the summer. Mm -hmm. I'd say start with the UCAT first as that's the test that comes first. But then later on, once you've got the hang of the UCAT, you can start going onto the BMAP closer to the end of the summer, probably about two or three months. Just bear in mind, you will be doing it during your A-level, so you will have slightly less time to put into the BMAP. So you want to start a bit earlier on. Absolutely. And I think that's a good key point that you finished on there is starting early. Um, and just a massive well done to everyone who is here today because you're looking at this in March. Given that you're looking at it in March and the UCAT isn't until at least July, let alone the BMAT that's even later, you have got that time to start with early preparation. But honestly, it is a consideration you need to make. If you're going to take both the UCAT and the BMAT alongside your personal statement, your work experience, your A-levels, you do need to be aware that there is an increased workload there. Um, and that can be one of the considerations you make when you decide whether you want to sit the BMAT or not because only you guys know your own workloads and what extra commitments you might need there. Okay so we'll move on ever so slightly. Um, as I mentioned at the start but I'll repeat it for anyone who's joined since then, today we're answering questions via Instagram. So if you go onto the MedicMind Instagram you can submit questions to us and throughout the session we'll pick out some of those questions to answer as we go through and hopefully most of them we will cover during the session anyway. And that's just highlighted here conveniently. Um, so we'll just move on from there. Right, so just to expand upon what Ashir was already saying at the start, there are certain universities that need the BMAT. Um, there is a little bit year on year, but generally it's quite consistent. Um, so it's usually Oxford and Cambridge, typically London universities and a selection of others. So here we've got Leeds, Keele, Lancaster and Brighton, Sussex. Make sure you check the university website in particular, just to make sure you've got the up to date knowledge um, and just make sure you look for any little caveats. So typically, for example, Oxford prefer the November sitting and certainly on their website at the moment, it says that they will only accept people who take the BMAT in November. But just look for little caveats like that and make sure you're up to date on the knowledge. But if you're considering applying to these universities, then you need to be thinking about sitting the BMAT. Ashir, is there anything you wanted to add to that at all? Yes. So just to add to that, Ellie, is that Kiel is actually BMAT for international students only. Otherwise, if you're a domestic student, and you're applying um, here and you've been here for longer than three years, you would typically apply as uh, without the UCAT or BMAT, I believe. Um, now, Oxford and Cambridge are obviously the ones that want a lot more or higher of a BMAT. Mm -hmm. um, Leeds typically weight it a lot less in their overall application. I think it's something like 20%. Whereas Brighton and Lancaster use a cutoff score. Oxford and Cambridge will typically look at students who have achieved above sixes on the first two section and typically 4A on the essays. UCL and Imperial, again, uh, Imperial has a banding system where they categorize each student from their background and then look at um, the BMAT score. Whereas US, UCL is a bit more holistic. Um, they do have an average um, acceptance around fives for the first two sections and 3A. And we'll explain what that marking means later on too. Um, so in terms of mm -hmm. risk, the Leeds, Lancaster and Brighton are a bit easier to get in with, with BMAT, whereas the other ones are quite a bit more harder. Fantastic. And you've just given a lot of information about the different universities there and how they use the BMAT differently this year. So 
if uh, students were going away from today, they want to actually find some of that information for themselves, where would be the best place for them to look for that? Actually, so you can find a lot of this on the um, website. So if you go mm -hmm. on, say, for example, UCL's entry mm -hmm. requirements and the admissions process page, if you just search up UCL, um, the entry requirements, you will come up with a page about what you need for the A-levels, what you need for GCSEs. And sometimes you can find a little PDF document that has about um, the entire admissions policy. So you can even search up UCL medicine admissions policy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times they will have in how they use the BMAT, how they use your A-levels and how they use your personal statement. And um, you can see what exactly they're going to use where and how they're going to use your interviews as well. Some universities um, don't even look at personal statements anymore. I know Leeds typically a couple of years back used it quite heavily. It was actually the final step after the BMAT and A-levels mm -hmm. where they um, took in the top 50% of performers in the personal statements for interviews. Um, so each university has their own admissions process. So it's important to know about them before you even apply to them to know how likely you are to get an offer as strategic applications tend to have uh, the highest success rates. Absolutely. So I'm going to pick up on what you said there, Ashir, because I think strategic applications is something that everyone needs to be very aware of. Um, so when we say strategic applications, for anyone who's not really looked at this before, you're not familiar with the idea, it's all about applying to your strengths with medical schools, because medical schools don't all ask for the same things. There will be some medical schools, as we've said already, where the BMAT is really important. So for example, if you're going for Oxford or Cambridge, if you're not very strong on the BMAT, you are far less likely to get an interview. Whereas there are some other universities that use it less, Similarly, there'll be some universities where the UCAT is really, really important or the personal statement is more important. And it's through looking at those admissions policies that you'll get a sort of feeling for which universities you're more likely to get into. Because ultimately, all of the medical schools are really competitive um, and you want to give your best shot at getting into a medical school. Um, and Ashir, I know one question that I certainly had when I was first applying was, are some medical schools better than others? Is there a best medical school to get into? What would you say to that? Um, that again, I had that question to myself as well, again and again, and um, my father's actually a doctor too. So um, what I actually searched up was a lot of the rank tables, and I, I see students asking about this a lot from time to time, and I ended up taking two gap years chasing after UCL and um, you know, the top university like King's College, when actually, if you look at the rank tables, they switch around um, quite a lot every year. I think yeah. last year, Dundee was right at the top. And, um, you know, Cambridge was not even in the top five. So it's, it's not, um, you know, something that you should look at because a lot of the medical school programs are standardized by the GMC. Now they're introducing something called the UKMLA, which is something you guys will be sitting in when you enter medical schools. So the curriculum is becoming more and more um, similar and you will have a central examination. What matters is if you go to medical school, they look at the individual student, how they perform in the, mm -hmm. um, in the entire course, what sort of um, audits you do or any kind of rotations or placements, uh, how you incorporate yourself in medical school is a lot more important. How you do in the exams is a lot more important than you know which medical school you're actually going to. Of course, some medical yeah. schools might have more facilities as um, Ellie and I know as well that Holyoke Medical School has quite a lot of emphasis on clinical placements and um, health and society and epidemiology, whereas some medical schools like Leeds are a bit more focused on applied life sciences. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all about your preference. Try not to hone in too much onto which university is better as they're all. If you get into a medical school, you are going to do quite well as a graduate. Absolutely. I think one of the commonest mistakes that a lot of candidates make is they go for what they see are the best universities by which, as you mentioned this year, which ones are highest on the league tables. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, any medical school you graduate from, you are still a doctor. Um, and that is the main goal here. You want to go to a medical school to become a doctor. And when you apply for your first jobs after medical school, they don't look at which medical school you've come from. So for example, I've got an academic foundation job for next year, which is one of the more competitive positions. They don't look at the fact that I'm from Hull York Medical School. As Ashir was saying, they look at what you've achieved throughout medical school. So if one of your reasons for applying for certain universities is about the prestige of it, then I just have a little rethink about actually why it is you want to go there. If it's other things like she was saying to do with facilities to do with location, then that's fine. But it's more important you get into a medical school and you become a doctor 
than necessarily applying to the top of the rank tables. So that's a slight aside from the whole BMAP presentation here, but it's one of the commonest mistakes that candidates make. And um, so it is worth pointing out here. Yeah. Okay. So we said there's just a handful of universities that use the, B, use the BMAT, but ultimately, if you are applying to one of these, you will need to take the exam. So that's why we're talking about this today. So for those of you who've logged into Menti, um, so the code again, it's at the top of the screen if you've not seen it or if you join slightly late, you can uh, go onto Menti and you can essentially answer this poll and we can see what your answers are. So a lot of people here are saying they're going to do both the UCAT and BMAT. Some people have said that they're unsure. And we've got a couple of people saying BMAT only. Someone said UCAT only. OK, so it's really good to actually see what your opinions are here because it's really useful for us and it tells us what things to focus on when we're delivering these sessions. Um, so in terms of those that have selected BMAT only, Ashir, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, of course. Um, so I think the BMAT is something that is slightly more riskier than the UCAT. As I mentioned earlier, um, Ellie, as well, and I think you'll agree with this, that, you know, the BMAT is something you will typically do, especially with COVID going on, after you apply. Mm. And like Oxford will only accept the um, students who sit in November. It's, it's a very unpredictable test. And some people actually find it harder than the UCAT. Mm. That has a, a bit more of a simple um, curriculum. But again, it's mostly with timing. That's an issue with the UCAT. But the BMAT has a bit more complicated um, information and you know questions uh, related to it the um there is an entire section on biology chemistry physics and maths which requires you to at least have understanding of the gcse curriculums and that's something you need to remember so it's a bit more extensive you have to probably do a bit more preparation in terms of remembering prior knowledge for it mm. um and you since you get the result afterwards and there is an entire section like the um the essays which you ideally cannot get too much um you know, feedback on or an official examiner to market, um, you know, that you can get somebody else to market, but again, they have their own kind of mark scheme, which is very vague. So you might not do too well. And if you sit the BMAT only, the universities um, themselves are very competitive as it is. And um, if you don't get a good score, you most likely will end up with all rejections. Whereas with the UCAT, you get the score on the spot as soon as you've done the test. And even if you get a slightly lower score, just like um, before Ellie discussed strategic applications, you can look into previously, for example, universities like Plymouth will accept um, a UCAT score of around 600 to 620 mm -hmm. from year to year. And you can apply to universities like those, or for example, Cardiff, which don't have a cutoff or any kind of minimum requirement. And you can you know, get an interview even without a top 10% UCAT score. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so ultimately, I'm not surprised that most people here have said they'll take both the UCAT and BMAT because, as we say, the UCAT is the majority of universities and most of you are here because you're planning on sitting the BMAT. So those who have said both, it's not a surprise there. Um, but just to re-emphasize some of the points that Ashir said there to do with if you're taking the BMAT only. So if we just imagine it timeline wise, I'm going to say some of the same information again. If you imagine that you're taking the BMAT in September, which means you'll take it before you've applied to medical school. If you leave it that late to take the BMAT and you didn't get the result you were hoping for, you've left it too late then to go back and do the UCAT. And similarly, if you then went and took the November sitting for the BMAT, you've already applied to the universities by then, so you won't know your result. So even if you're feeling very confident on the BMAT, if you just had a bad day, if the questions didn't go your way on the day, then ultimately, as Ashir said, you could end up with four rejections. Whereas actually, if you mix up your choices a little bit and say you put one or two BMAT universities and then put some that are asking for the UCAT instead, so a bit more of a mixture, then you've just got a bit of a safer approach to your application. Um, so for those people who have said BMAT only, I mean, it's absolutely your choice what you want to do, but I'd really encourage you just to have a look at it again and just consider whether that risk is worth taking from your perspective. Um, for those who are unsure, that's completely valid. Um, and I think it really does depend where you're going to be applying. If you don't know if you're applying to a BMAT university, then you don't know if you're going to take the BMAT and that's absolutely fine. So I'm glad that those people have come along today to find out a bit more about the exam first and foremost. Um, Ashir, I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions off of the Instagram, if that's okay. Um, 
So one of the questions that we've been asked is, can we retake it and what happens if we fail? Which I suppose they're quite negative questions, um, but would you be able to answer those? Yeah, so with the BMAT, retaking it, you can only do it once per application cycle. So if you don't get such a high score, unfortunately, you won't be able to retake it in that year. You would have to mm -hmm. take a gap year and sit it again. Um, so for example, if you sat the BMAT only and you haven't got that much of a high score, it's a bit of a gamble whether or not you get an interview. Mm -hmm. um, if you put one choice down, you know, sometimes you might not get that uh, interview and it's absolutely fine. You might have three UCAT universities um, sitting around, mm -hmm. which, which is what quite a lot of people do. Um, but you'd have to sit in next year, essentially. Same with the UCAT as well. Your score for that year, you can only sit once. The exception is for the UCAT, the BMAT is if you have technical issues. And a few people have had it this year with COVID because some people sat the exam at home or there was a there was quite a bit of a, I think uh, you might know about this earlier as well, section three. Yeah. Actually, um, there was a little technical glitch where they weren't able to complete the paper or the question didn't show mm -hmm. up. So they allowed people to resit in February. Now, um, that's the exceptions that are allowed. So if you have anything that goes wrong during the exam, um, especially with the UCAT, say, for example, the calculator doesn't work or, you know, mm -hmm. um, your screen's not showing up or you should flag it up straight away as it gives you an opportunity to do it again. Um, I don't think there's an actual definition of, of failing these exams. You could get a lower yeah. end of the mark, but, you know, something like the UCAT, if you get a score of 500 in total, which is the universal mark given, and that's way below average. Mm -hmm. And most universities will not consider you there, if not all of them. And, you know, if you do fail it, then the next options are to kind of look at your A-levels and think, are my predicted A-stars and A's, am I going to get those? If you do, then you can take a gap year, which is what I did two times in a row. It's a bit um, stressful, but it's something you, it just seems like a blip once you've done it. Um, mm -hmm. You will eventually get into medical school if you get really good A-levels, because these tests are a bit of a barrier um, to entry to medical school and a bit of a filtration system that they use as, um, you know, you can eventually with enough practice and enough knowing the strategies do better on them. It's so only practice will make better for the, both of these. So you can either take a gap here or some people actually go to another degree and do an undergraduate in biomed or neuroscience, for example, and then apply the postgraduate route. But in that circumstance, you don't have the BMAT as much anymore. Um, there, there would be more popularly the GAMSAT, which is a lot more of a difficult test. And some universities will expect you to do the UCAT. Some universities might look back at your A-levels, again, will require you to have lower entry requirements there, or they might even look at your um, degree and expect you to get a minimum 2-1 in there. Yeah, so just to, again, just to highlight the answer to those two questions that you answered there, Ashir. So first of all, can you retake it? We said no, not in that particular cycle. So you can retake it if, for example, you took a gap year and you applied again the next year, which is the same as the UCAT. So with both the UCAT and BMAT, you said it once in that application cycle. So as Ashir was saying, if it doesn't go to plan, it's good to have a mix of universities, some that don't require the BMAT, just so you've got a backup so that you can still get some interview offers in that year. Um, and then the other question there was about failing it um, and we were saying there there's not a fail mark as such um, but it's more is your score high enough to be competitive for that university mm -hmm. so rather than it being a pass fail test and um, mm -hmm. so hopefully that's helped for anyone who's wondering about those okay so the next question is if you are considering taking the BMAT which most of you were at least considering it would you prefer September or November. And then we'll start talking through the pros and cons of both. So this is just to gauge what your initial opinions are. You're not committed to this. It's just what are your thoughts at the moment? We'll just wait to get a few more responses in. Okay, so a reasonably even split, but a slight preference there towards September. So I think this shows how long I've been at medical school now in that actually when I was applying, there wasn't a September sitting. It was only a November sitting uh, because the September was a more recent introduction. Um, 
one of the pros of the September sitting is that it means you've sat the BMAT before you've put in your UCAS application. So for anyone who's looked at the timelines, you submit your UCAS application in October. So it means you'll have sat the exam and you'll have a feeling of how that's gone before you've gone and applied through UCAS. Whereas, of course, if you took the November sitting, you'll be applying without having any idea of how that exam might have gone. Um, so that's one aspect to consider. Ashia, can you think of any other pros or cons for September versus November? I think um, September, yeah. So in September, if you sit the BMAT earlier, uh, one of the pros is that you will have a lot more time to focus on your A-levels, especially mm -hmm. in both biology and chemistry and obviously a third subject as well. Um, they can be quite demanding for the amount of time you need to spend and the amount of studying you need to do. So you have a bit more time to focus on those. And it means you get the UCAS application done with quicker. It's just a lot less stressful for you. Mm -hmm. November sitting, you kind of delay it out. So you have, you're stuck in that loop of I've submitted my uh, application and I'm still preparing for the BMAT. I think leaving things to the last minute is something you, you need to try and get rid of before you go to medical school. Because a lot of the times those students who leave things to last minute in medical school find it a lot harder to keep up with the cost. Mm -hmm. Um, with the, um, as Ellie said, uh, back when she was applying, there was no September sitting. I think even when I was applying, there was no September sitting, mm. which was only about three years ago now. So, um, you know, it's quite new. I would highly recommend, you know, doing it earlier. You do do the test early September and get the results sometimes late September. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you will have your result beforehand and you can see actually, well, do I need to, can I apply to Oxford or Cambridge or do I need to apply to a slightly less risky BMAT? university and that way it's just like the UCAT you can um, pick and mix the universities accordingly whereas November you're going in a bit blind and you're just trusting your instinct to mm -hmm. do really good on the exam which might not be the case but yeah yeah absolutely so there's a lot there in favor of the September sitting in terms of the fact that you're getting the result early it's less of a clash with your A-levels because it's actually really important to focus on your A-levels much as we talk about these entrance exams ultimately you can take a gap year and apply again if they go badly whereas your a-levels is a bit harder to get around that and um, so you want to make sure that your primary focus is still on your studies that being said people do choose the november sitting and i think there are some advantages to that as well and um, so if you're somebody who actually wants to really focus on the ucat in the lead up to the summer and then say the ucat doesn't go to plan and you want a bit of time to think about the bmat or you want to just spread things out further so Ashir said that actually one thing that's good about September is that you can condense it all and get it done early. But actually, if you're someone that would rather spread out this process, then November might be a preference. So think about what works best for you and um, make a decision early. So one of the biggest issues is if you leave this decision and then you don't plan your revision appropriately. So like Ashir was saying, pushing things back and pushing things back can lead to a problem. But if you say, actually, no, November is my decision and you work towards it, then that can still be very effective. Um, but yeah, it's something to consider. And for anyone who said that they don't know, that's very valid. Um, hopefully we've given you some points to think about and you can carry on thinking over the coming months because we are still very early in the preparation. Just to add what, uh, to yeah. what Ellie said there is air time management is everything with these exams and also applying to medical school. So when you come to medical school, you need to make sure that you actually do work consistently. So if you do leave it to November, which is absolutely fine, a lot of people have done it in November and got a lot of really good scores. Um, the only thing I would advise against is, you know, leaving yourself too much work in September, yeah. October and November. That way you will be cramming work in alongside your A-levels, which can be quite detrimental. But if you do it consistently over the summer and do work slowly towards it, building up to the exam, you'll find it a lot more easier to tackle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as we start to talk through the different sections, as we're about to do, hopefully it'll become clear what we mean by these types of revision that you might be doing for the exam, because it's slightly different prep to what you might be doing for the UCAT as well. Um, so in terms of the exam structure, so there are going to be three main sections to the BMAT. And as I understand, it, it's a two hour exam. Is that right, Ashir? Roughly, yes. Yeah. Um, so we'll go through each of those three sections and just the kinds of things that are covered by them. So looking at section one, Ashir, can you talk us through what we might expect to see in section one of the BMAT? So section one of the BMAT actually has a range of questions. It's normally called the um, critical thinking and the problem solving um, uh, part of the exam. Now, um, 
as you can see here, there's a range of different types of questions. So assumptions, conclusions, flaws, inferences, and use of evidence. So what you will typically get is a passage here. It could be on anything. Sometimes it might be even about astronauts or you know r random things happening in the uh, in the world, and you have to answer based on the questions um, what you think the main conclusion is or one of the conclusions from the um, answer choices. So it's typically multiple choice. Um, you have 32 questions. You used to have 35, and it's about 60 minutes mm -hmm. long for critical thinking and problem solving. So you'll have a mixture of these um, two topics. Um, mm -hmm. Critical thinking is a bit easier than problem solving. Personally, I found. Um, when I started the BMAT, um, the main type of um, question you'll probably get is more of finding conclusions. The use of evidence and um, assumptions are slightly more rare. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be quite um, you know, informed about the different techniques on how to find a conclusion, what is a conclusion. You need to understand the idea of what premises in a different, um, in a passage and coming to different, um, you know, the answer choices look very similar. So you need, there are Quite a lot of conclusions in a passage and when they ask for a quite for example what a main conclusion is that might be different to any type of conclusion so you have slightly more time than the ucat with the bma i think you have about a minute and a half roughly to do each question and um when you are doing these questions you have to kind of do, dissect each of the passages for critical thinking into what's the premise what's the conclusion why is the author, author writing this and you know know what a flaw is know what inference is mm -hmm one evidence is um, to you know the argument and you can often find the answers that way for problem solving um, you will need um, quite a bit of a mental math and you're not allowed a calculator actually for the BMAT so you need to work with um, sometimes some complex numbers mm -hmm. you'll typically get some questions where you might have like for the cubes that's where you get a net and it says what um, cube will this net make I've seen some people use rubbers um, to kind of draw the net out on their rubber, which is which is technically allowed. Um, you can do that. I found those per personally quite difficult. You get questions with speed, distance, time, and they aren't the tip. They aren't um, like the UCAT ones. These are slightly harder mm -hmm. again because you are not allowed a calculator. You have to work with fractions a lot of the times, and you need to memorize what some fractions are as percentages. Pin codes. There are two different types of pin codes questions. Some are simpler than others. You get a little riddle where you have to work out what a pin code is for a certain question. Date and time, again, you tend to get a problem. For example, um, someone it might give you a little timeline of somebody baking cookies and saying, you know, they take 15 minutes to make the first batch of 12 cookies and they're making 140 in total. It takes them 15 minutes to prepare the dough and they put it into the oven for 10 minutes, then take half an hour rest and they'll ask, okay, they start at this time. When do they finish making 140 of these or 144 of them? So it's actually something that's quite, it, the questions are quite complicated you don't have enough time to complete them all and interpreting tables and graphs and answering questions based off them. It's, it's quite a wide variety of questions. Um, you do get some questions more so than others. And it's something that is an aptitude test. So it will test a lot of your knowledge of these, um, you know, the ability to do these questions. And surprisingly, you don't need to know much prior knowledge apart from being quite good with mental arithmetic. Absolutely. So I like what you said there, Ashir, in that section one is more of an aptitude test. So it's more similar to the UCAT in that respect, in that you don't need to go in there with scientific knowledge, whereas there are other parts of the BMAT where that knowledge will then come in use. Um, but certainly for this section, um, if you look at the official website for the BMAT, you can find practice papers and start looking at these kinds of questions. That's really useful. Um, and equally, if you look at the Medic Mind YouTube channel, you can see some examples of questions being worked through. So you can start to get familiar with this because I realize coming to these webinars, it's a lot of information. Ashir's talked through a lot of the different types of questions you might expect there. Um, but just start getting familiar with them because it is about your approach um, and about actually using that critical thinking to actually get around these questions. So that's section one of the BMAT. So we'll move on then to have a look at, oh, okay, I thought this was a different way around, but that's fine. We've got a practice question here, brilliant. So what we'll actually do here is we'll give you some time to think about this. Um, so a bit like we did last week, we'll go quiet briefly so that you can all have a read of this question and you can choose your answer. I believe you'll have a poll that pops up on the screen to allow you to submit what your answer will be. Um, and then we'll see what your answers are and we'll talk it through. So we'll actually go quiet for just a minute to let you have a look at this question.
Okay, so we've got questions, we've got answers in from about half of you here. So we'll just give you another 10 seconds or so just to reach an answer. Okay, and I'm just going to end the poll there. Okay, hopefully, uh, yeah, you can all see the results now. So the most popular answer to this question was answer C. So before we go through whether that was the correct answer, we'll actually talk through the approach to this question. And hopefully anyone who got a different answer, you can then start to think about which answer would have been correct for this question. Um, so Ashir, starting to look at this question then, just as you alluded to, it's not sort of classic question that you might see, say, in a science exam. So where would you start with this? So with the BMAT, actually, you have a bit more time to read the passage. Um, in the UCAT, however, you get something similar for verbal reasoning. With this one, you, you have a bit more time to actually read the passage. It's not that long. You can actually get away with reading this. Something I would first do is read the question first to see, okay, what are they asking for here? Is it a conclusion or the main conclusion? Mm. Over here, they're asking, what's the main conclusion of the argument? And just quickly skimming through the answer choices. Um, and you know that the main topic's about the moon and the solar eclipse and the moon's orbit. So if you go ahead and read um, the passage here, you just want to quickly mm -hmm. read through it. And then what you can do is actually look at a piece of like answer A and then look back at the text. You want to try and look for the key topics here. So over here is talking about the moon's orbit and the sun as well, blocking out the sun. And as we can see at the end of the passage there, it says that in addition, the moon's actual orbit is elliptical, often um, taking it far away and uh, enough uh, away from the earth that its apparent size is not large enough to block the sun entirely. And you can see here, that's actually a contradiction. Um, typically in school, we usually think, you know, the main conclusion or any conclusion is at the end of a text or at the end of an essay, which isn't always the case with the BMAT. Mm -hmm. You will sometimes find it mentioned several times, um, even at the start or towards the middle as well. What's better is actually look for extreme language here. So things like, as you can see over here, the truth of the matter or things like, however, or the most important of all. These kind of words are a bit more extreme and, you know, it points towards what the author actually is writing about. So you want to spend some time just thinking, um, what is the main purpose of why the author has written this text? And um, if you look at um, B, that is true. Um, the th third um, last line does say the moon's actual orbit is elliptical. But this is what I meant by premise, which I talked about earlier on. It's what's leading up the argument leading up to the main conclusion. So it's not actually what's the main reason why it's being written. It's just a part of the statement to say, you know, this is what the moon's um, orbit is. The main uh, thing that's been um, talked about the most here is the, um, the solar eclipse, which we know um, is something that's the main kind of um, topic. So that is going to relate to that, the main conclusion. Mm -hmm. Look at C, which is the most popular answer choice, which I'm kind of glad of as well that everybody's put that, is that solar eclipses do not happen that often. And that is actually the correct answer because um, it says it's a rare phenomenon. Now, one of the things you want to get used to is having just a good knowledge of vocabulary. If you have a wide set of vocabulary and know quite a lot of synonyms for words, for example, something that's not happening that often is a phenomenon, you can actually very easily link that up. So it's good to skim mm -hmm. through the passage always read the question first and know what they're asking rather than reading this first and going to the question. Luckily, the question is always at the top of the passage. So you will get to see, um, sorry, the other way around, it's at the bottom of the passage when you're yeah. doing the exam. So you will see the other way around. Um, you just focus on the question first, see what is it asking me, go back and look at what answer choices you have and try to link things up. Once you get the answer C, this one is quite um, obviously C, you can if you have time, cross check D and E if that is the case. But as you know, when you um, said B is true, you can also look at E. It says the moon is a perfectly circular orbit. You don't need to go back to the text. You can just rule out some choices like that. That's how you would tackle that kind of question. Perfect. Thank you, Ashir. Um, so some key points from what you've said there. So the conclusion is not always going to be at the end of the paragraph. So whereas we're used to conclusions being at the end, that's not necessarily the case there might be multiple conclusions in 
the paragraph, but it's what is the main conclusion, as you were saying, with the premise there. Um, so in this case, we were saying, uh, for example, the moon's actual orbit is elliptical. It's a reasonable statement, but it's not the main point of the paragraph. The main point was solar eclipses do not happen that often, which is why the answer was C rather than B. So that's where actually this is a step beyond just searching for information. This is also that extra level of critical thinking, which is why it's in section one of the BMAT. And um, so for anyone whose first experience of a question was this, um, thank you for giving that a go. Don't worry if you got it wrong because you've got lots of time to practice these questions, but hopefully you found that useful just to experience one of those questions. So that's an example from section one. Okay, so this next question is from the problem solving element of section one. So we did critical thinking, now we're looking at problem solving. So it's a slightly different type of question. And again, the poll will have popped up on your screen. And um, so we'll go quiet again for a minute, give you a chance to start answering. And once we start getting quite a few answers through, we'll then unmute ourselves and start going through the question. So we'll give you some time to look at that. So just for the sake of time, we'll just give you a few more seconds to submit answers before we end the poll. So if you've got a rough idea, just give it a guess at this point, because we will talk it through as well, just to make sure we get through everything today. OK, and I'll end the poll there. So that's actually quite a spread across the board we've got there. So the most popular answer was A, but we've also got quite a few people going for every option there, um, which again, I think that just shows that this is quite an intimidating question. So we'll just have a look back at it. So the question is asking which two friends have their birthdays on the same day of the week as each other every year? So you've got to start thinking about a really logical way of approaching this because that's not a standard sort of maths question that you would get um, in sort of GCSE or A-level setting. So we've got four people here. And for each of these four people, you're told what day of the year their birthdays are on. So the first thing that I would think is I've got lots of combinations of people here. So the combinations we've got here are essentially the different pairings that these four people could go in. So what we need to look at is what is the difference between those numbers of days? Because if we're looking for it to be on the same day each year, the difference in the number of days needs to be a multiple of seven. So this might just take a moment to click, but once you appreciate why, it really makes a lot of sense. So if, for example, uh, you took someone whose birthday was on the 114th day and the 163rd day, if the difference between those two is a number that's divisible by seven, that tells you it's going to land on the same day if you were looking at a calendar. So you would start to work it out in that way and look at the difference between the days for each pairing and figure out which one is divisible by seven. So if you went through that, you would find that the answer to this was A. So that was the most popular answer, which shows that some of you at least were able to work through this. Um, and it's intimidating. I found this question really intimidating to look at. Um, Ashir, is there any other advice you'd give for this type of question? Yeah, as you said, Ali, um the answer needs to be, or the difference between the days needs to be divisible by seven. One thing I would say here is um, A is the correct answer, and you guys did really well with that. Um, you can actually, for Jack and Nee Young over here, you can just take the um, days here and then subtract them. You'll get the answer 49, which is the only one which is divisible by seven. If you think Monday, for example, is the first day, and then seven days later, you have Monday again, which is the eighth day. 
So eight mm -hmm. minus one is seven. You'll have the same thing if you did with Wednesday, which is the third day. The next Wednesday is the 10th day. So again, the difference is seven. If you think of it easier that way rather than using large chunks of numbers there, it makes it a lot more easier to understand. So um, what you would actually do is you can make a nice little table out of this and just put abbreviations. You will, I think somebody has asked on the Instagram where I get some paper or anything to write on. Actually in, um, in a paperless world, I know that you would get, um, you know, when you're using a device with COVID going on, you would get uh, some paper to use. But um, in a standard test when COVID has gone away, hopefully you will have just a pen and paper and actually the answer um, where you write the answers is on a completely different sheet. It's a pink sheet that you would have done the maths challenges on in school. Mm -hmm. You could just put a pencil lining for the answer, which it gets marked, marked by a computer. So you will have the entire BMAP paper where the questions are written on to make notes on. Over here, you can make an, um, just abbreviate each person's name. So Jack is J, Neyoung is NY, and you can just do a little table to just put in the differences. The first answer that you get um, with an answer that's divisible by seven, that's your answer. And that cuts down the time immensely. If you were to think and put, you know, uh, Monday is the first day, Tuesday is the second day, and then go and make a massive table out of that, it's, it'll take too much time. Absolutely. And I think that's the key point for both you, Kat and BMAT. What a lot of you are probably very used to when you're at school is when you're doing an exam, you will have a bit of time left over. You can work through some of the other answers and see if they work. Unfortunately, you probably won't have the time for that in this exam. You might have a bit of extra time. So if there's another plausible answer you want to work through, that's fine. But typically with the UCAT and BMAT, once you find an answer, you just need to stick with it because the time is so limited and you don't want to end up getting a question absolutely right, but then not finishing the exam because the amount of marks you would lose just isn't worth it in that situation. And just something to add to that, Ellie, is that you want yeah. to probably remember some key facts like in a day there's 24 hours and there's 1,440 mm -hmm. minutes and 86,400 seconds. You might want to also remember in the leap year, there's 366 days and 365 days in a normal year. And just use something called the knuckle method as well. So if you actually look at your um, knuckles, the, wherever your knuckles are and then the gaps in between, you can say this is 31 days, this is 30 days, and um, 31 days again. So you can say January, February, March. Obviously, February is going to have 28 or 29 days. So do account for that because some of the questions do have trick questions. Um, you know, I mean, trick information in there just to make you confused about February as um, they sometimes put leap years in and... Um, mm -hmm does confuse you a little bit. Perfect. So we do have another question up now. I'm just very aware that we've only got 10 minutes left. And at the moment, we're talking about section one. Um, so what I think we might actually do, because there'll be a recording of this session, is we might actually not give you the answer to this one, give you a chance to go away, figure it out. And next week, we can tell you what the answer is. And that will hopefully keep some of you coming back as well, just because I think it's really important for us to get through all the information for you today, um, rather than necessarily go through more questions just for the moment. So well done to everyone who is popping in answers, but I'll actually move us on. Um, and when you check out the recording, you can spend more time going through this question. Okay, so I will just move on for the time being. Okay, so looking at section two of the BMAT then, Ashir, can you talk us through what section two involves? So section two, yes, it involves um, biology, chemistry, physics, and maths, all at GCSE level. And this table very nicely shows what kind of questions have come up since 2009. You don't need to know the entire specification. Mm -hmm. um, having good knowledge of topics is good, but for example, heart and circulation, there's only one question that's come up since 2009. There are 27 questions in total on section two, and they are spread across biology, chemistry, physics, and maths quite equally. So you're not going to get a question on all of these topics necessarily. There might be a paper where you don't get asked on cell structure at all. The way that they do these questions is not actually as a memory recall. In GCSEs, you do a lot of regurgitation on what you already know, and you maybe give the definition of an enzyme. But in here, you will actually get a question and four choices which all seem correct. It'll say, for example, what characteristics are um, true for um, respiration? And then it'll give you a few, four different answers where some of the um, elements are correct, some of them are incorrect. And you have to actually mm -hmm. use your knowledge and um, deduce, right, am I, um, is this the correct option or not? And it's actually uh, testing quite a few things. So you need to know, 
you know, your concepts about respiration, inheritance and genetics is quite mm -hmm. common. The previous question is on that too. So um, knowing a lot about, you know, um, hybrid crosses and the different homozygous and heterozygous um, cross pairs is very important. So you can go back to these questions and actually answer them um, as there is quite a few questions on that. Excellent. And I think this is one of the most common questions that a lot of students have is what topics should I be revising for section two? Mm -hmm. um, so as a lot of you may be aware already, the typical standard is GCSE standard knowledge. Um, but some of you will have sat different exam boards and so on. So it tends to be pretty common topics that come up. So for example, inheritance and genetics, homeostasis, most exam boards will contain something on that topic. So it's quite universal for a lot of you. Um, but as Ashir was mentioning, topics like heart and circulation, that's only come up once since 2009, doesn't mean that it won't come up, but it's far less likely. So if you're going to use your time wisely in your preparation, you're better off spending more time on the topics that are likely to come up. So this is for biology. Physics, I think physics is a really important one to touch upon because not everyone here will necessarily study physics. I know I didn't do physics for A-level. Um, so if you're somebody who's not been doing physics, this is something you might have to pick up as an extra when you're preparing for the BMAT. And you certainly don't want to be going through your whole GCSE curriculum again. So similarly, it's important to pick up the common topics there. So what we can see is frequency and amplitude of waves, uh, circuits, radioactivity. These are quite common topics that have come up. But again, check out some of the official mock papers, see what the questions look like, get familiar with them um, and just make sure you use your time wisely in your preparation so you don't have to do all of GCSE physics again to prepare for this section. OK, so that covers section two there. Um, I believe we do have a side going through section three, if I'm not mistaken. I yeah, so. A bit about section three, and then we'll go back to that previous slide with some resources. Uh, so section three of the BMAT, Ashir, could you talk us through what that involves? So yes, um, you have to write an essay and it typically you have to write it within half an hour. You have, you're expected to spend about 10 minutes planning it. Um, even though that doesn't get marked, um, you have to probably write an essay. It's not that long at all. You get um, a page of it around A4 sheet just to um, write the entire answer down. Um, they're looking for, um, first of all, your English language, your writing skills, and also your argument skills as well. How do you um, construct an essay? So, um, you know, people who are typically good at debating will do well on this, I find. But um, you don't need to know anything about the essays. There are reoccurring themes every year. Um, for example, there'll be one that's medically related, one's about philosophy, and off the top of my head, I'm forgetting about the third one. But again, you can choose any of the three um, uh, questions and year to year they're quite similar so again it's not testing your knowledge necessarily of the topic they're assessing your ability to write and make um, a convincing argument for both sides so and if you look at the mark scheme for section three they're actually looking for somebody who uses um, good punctuation good grammar good sentence structure but then other than that they're looking at someone who's quite convincing for the for and against arguments and makes a balanced um, conclusion as well so um, typically you don't want to spend too much time writing an introduction for this. You want to argue at least one or two sides for and one or two sides against and make a nice conclusion. Again, as you can see, this one is quite an ethical debate. So um, there's quite a few things you can write about this. And I think sometimes it's good to basically just research some medical ethics before the BMAT because it is something that does come up time to time and it gives you a lot more to um, write about. And, um, you know, if you read the GMC guidelines or you know about the four pillars of medicine, it can be great mm -hmm. to apply to a lot of questions year on year. Absolutely. And actually, those topics you just mentioned there, Ashir, knowing about the four pillars, a bit about medical ethics, you'll use those again in your medical interview. So that's not wasted time. That's actually a really useful um, application where you can revise for the BMAT, but also revise for your interviews at the same time. Um, so I think you've picked up a couple of really important points there, Ashir, in that actually things like punctuation and sentence structure, it's not to the extreme, but you need to make sure that you're making a logical sense there. Um, and I know some people here, if you're taking purely sciences for A-level, you might not have written an essay in a little while. Um, so it's not something to be afraid of, but it probably is something that's worth practicing and 
getting used to again, just so that you're used to writing that within the half an hour as well. And you know how much time you've got to plan based on how long it takes you to write an essay. So just getting used to that. Um, and the other key point there is make sure you're debating both sides or all sides of the argument, depending what the question is. It's not just about giving your opinion. Um, and this is very true of interviews as well. Much as you might give an opinion, you want to make sure you're being very well-rounded because they're more concerned with you arguing all of the sides of an argument than with simply giving an opinion. Perfect. So I'm just going to step back a slide then because we just skimmed over there some free um, BMAT resources through Medic Mind. Uh, so just to talk through these. So we've got a couple of pieces through the Medic Mind website. So we've got BMAT Solutions and BMAT Blog. And then also I've mentioned the YouTube channel already. And um, there's lots of resources on our YouTube channel, um, including actually our webinar from last week. So if anyone didn't come to the UCAT one and wants to look back at that, that's also available on YouTube as well. Um, feel free to you know give us a like, give us a comment. Um, uh, if you're interested um, and check out some of our resources on there as well. So we've just got a couple of minutes coming towards the end of this presentation today. So we'll just pick up just a couple more questions uh, from the Instagram just to finish off. So Ashir, was there anything else from the questions on the Instagram that stood out to you? So yeah, um, some people have asked what's a very good score. Um, that's yeah. something that I thought I'd just quickly brush over as well. Now, there is not a definition of a, like a perfect score for the BMAT. There are some people who have achieved, you know, it, it's, it's scored between three to nine for section one and two, which is a con conversion from, you know, 32 uh, marks for um, the section one and 27 for section two into a universal mark scale, they would call it. Um, some people get sevens and sixes, which is very high, translate to around 80, 90% at times and get like a 5A on the essay writing section. There is no perfect score. Um, again, you want the score as high as possible just so you get an interview. After that stage, a lot of universities will use your BMAT either as a backup if you were very identical to another student or um, you, know, you, you might be judged mostly on your interview. So it's important to realize um, you, know, you want to make sure you can get as high a score as you can, but you, know, you want to balance it out well with other factors too. I think um, one of the other things is um, do uh, many people take a gap year to retake it? Mm. And um, I think a lot of students are really worried about gap years. You know, if I take a gap year, will I get into medical school? It's going to ruin my chance of getting in. Um, I had a lot of people telling me saying, if you take a gap year, you, you can't get into medicine. You, you won't be able to do it. Um, essentially, if that ever happens and you don't get the perfect score, or you don't get the score that you need to get into university, that's absolutely fine. Um, you're not at any detriment. Um, Ellie knows and I know as well that there is a huge proportion of students that come in as gap year students yes. and the, or come in as graduates, even at Holyoke Medical School, which is a traditionally five year course. There are people coming as graduates. So you can still apply to undergraduate options if you want. You know, that might be a bit more expensive so you don't get student loan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we'll just round off with some key points from today. So thank you so much to everyone who's come along. Hopefully you've all taken something away from it, whether you knew nothing about the BMAT at the start or whether you already knew quite a lot. Hopefully we've shared at least some information here that's useful to you. Um, so to round it off, so the BMAT is an exam that you can choose to take if you're interested in certain medical schools compared to the UCAT that you would take pretty much universally for any medical school. With the BMAT, there are three core sections that we've been through today. Um, so for each of those sections, you've got slightly different types of questions. Section two is the one where you've got more focus on the GCSE curriculum. So that's worth revising a bit more science for. But section one is more to do with your critical thinking and problem solving. And section three is an essay. With the exam, you can sit it either in September or November in most years, but keep an eye out because COVID has changed things slightly, so keep up to date on the information. Um, and if you're interested in seeing a bit further about the exam um, or just reading a bit more in general, you can check out the Medic Mind website or our YouTube channel and you can find more information there. Um, so again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And thank you, Ashir. Um, I know this was your first of these webinars, so I hope you enjoyed presenting as well today. It's been lovely. Um, thank you for coming, guys. And um, thank you for having me, Ali. Lovely. And we'll see, uh, hopefully, most of you again next week for our next webinar. Thank you very much.